The title of today's message is Just Passing Through, and I'd like to start in Genesis 47. If you got a Bible, some people actually still have those. Genesis 47, and the context here is the um, story of Joseph at the end, his family saved, and uh, they find out they're saved through their, their, his youngest son, Jacob's jo- youngest son, Joseph. And Genesis 47, verse 7, then Joseph brought in his father Jacob and set him before Pharaoh, and a very interesting thing happened. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Very interesting that that's what his inclination was to do. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. So what does he refer to his life as? A pilgrimage. If you are on a pilgrimage, you are not from where you are, and you are not where you're going. Okay? You are not where you are from, and you are not where you're going. And so he says, describes the years of his life as that. Go to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And this is where the temple has been built, and... Um, Dedication of this thing in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 10. Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Now, here's just not even parenthetically, this is what this is about today. If you spend most of your time watching TV, social media, reading newspapers, and the last place you land is the Scripture, you will forget who you are, where you're from, why you're here, and where you're really headed. And you can get sucked into the world, sucked into the system, sucked into the arguments, and get so spun up that you become, you get frustrated, you get angry, and you get out of control. You have to read the scriptures because the scriptures will recalibrate your heart, your mind, your life, and help you say, okay, God, I know whose I am, I know where I am and why I'm here, I know where I'm going, and you just recalibrate and say, it's going to be okay. Because when you focus on who he is and who you are in him, things are going to go a lot more smoothly than they do if you leave him out. So that little stretch there, verse 11, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to, to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. So this is a very interesting principle. If you read the context here, the rest of the story, they are bringing, it's gold, silver, it's massive amounts of offering. And the acknowledgement here is everything that we're giving you, we got from your hand in the first place. So we have nothing that you did not give us. And then verse 15, for we are aliens and pilgrims before you, as were all our fathers, our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope. Um, Aliens and pilgrims. Matthew chapter 6. Now, it is a very odd thing to think in terms of being from somewhere that you have never been. So, the only way you make heaven is to be born again, right? That's how you enter into the kingdom of God. So, heaven itself is then where we're headed and kind of where we're from because we're his family. So how crazy is it to be from someplace you've never been? Um, 
And do we even think about heaven? Do we even think about going where we're going and that we, we're literally just passing through here? There are way too many people, me included, along the way where we, we just settle down. And I've always used this in my head, at least, in terms of an airport. And, a, and the terrible name, the building where you wait for your flight, as I've said before, a terminal is a terrible name for a building that you wait for a, a flight, right? But this is kind of one, the world is one big terminal. And we're born physically in the terminal, and you're flying out of here somewhere. You are not going to stay in the terminal. You are leaving. The question is, what does your ticket say? And the terminals, at least DFW, I mean, I think they've got terminals out there they've spent a billion dollars on. It's hotels, it's restaurants, it's stores. You could literally be blindfolded, dropped in a terminal at DFW and not know where you were. And if you couldn't see out the window that there were planes, you'd think you were in a city, in a mall, just kind of a, a retail area. And so we think, wow, this is a great place. Let's just stay here. That is not the point. That is not what this is about. And if you know that you are out of here and you're just passing through, then how do you spend your time while you're passing through? And what, how do you interact with other people along the way? A uh, lady cited today was on a flight and met a woman and set up a time a week later or so. They're going to talk. And her conversation with her was about Jesus and so she's on a plane. You say, well, they were on the same flight together. It's not just about an, a casual, coincidental flight. God puts you and me in specific places for one reason. And it's either to reach someone with the gospel or find out if they're not a believer and encourage them along the way in some way. And that's what we're doing while we're what? Just passing through. So look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. So even when Jesus teaches them to pray, look what comes up pretty quick. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven. You, well, why do you have to say in heaven? Of course, that's where he is. Because when you pray the our Father's prayer, our Father in heaven, you remember who he is, that he is our Father, and where he is. He is somewhere that we are not, we've never been, but that's where we're headed. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. How is his will done in heaven? I promise you, when God speaks in heaven, it happens. And I don't think he's counting in heaven with the angels. Okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to count to three, and I want some obedience. One, you know, there's no counting in heaven. When he says something, it happens. And so what are you praying when you pray this? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come here, your will be done here. So what I'm saying to God when I pray this is, I want the rule and reign, your rule and reign in my life here and now, and I want your will to be done here in the same way it is there, and that would be now, instant. Yes, sir, thank you, sir, I'm on it. Instead of this whiny, wishy-washy, ah, I think I heard the Holy Spirit say this, but I'm going to pray about it. Let me tell you something. Get prayed up before he tells you something to do, then you don't spend as much time wishy-washy about doing it. What do you got to pray about when God tells you to do something? Oh, I'm going to make sure. If you're walking and talking with Jesus, when you hear his voice, you're going to know it's him, and then you do it. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. But he points them to the Father in heaven. That is where we are headed. And if you lose sight of that, and you lose sight of the hope of that, and the promise of that, you can get bogged down down here and spend all of your time looking around and overwhelmed and, oh my gosh, we're not going to make it. It's all, it's, it's the end of the world, which is coming, by the way, but it's not the end of my world. My world will never end. I will spend eternity with God in heaven forever, guaranteed. Go to Matthew 6, 19. Now, we read this stuff. You cannot just read these verses and not apply these verses. Verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Now, I don't know how you can be more clear about that. Right? So, 
Are you just stockpiling treasure? You say, well, yeah, I'm preparing. What are you preparing for? Uh, I'm preparing to give it all to ministry. Oh, I see. So we're going to wait till later. Now, people get upset with me. They say, well, you said this, and now I'm upset about that. I'm like, I don't know what else to say but what it says. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. So how much treasure do I have on this side? And the real question we're going to get to in a second is, do I have more treasure on this side than the other side? If you look at your ledger book, what's it look like? Why do you not lay the treasures on, on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal? But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So he's not saying don't lay up treasures. He's just saying lay them up some other place in heaven. So if you wake up every day and say, okay, Lord, this is the day you've made. I'm going to rejoice, be glad in it. What's the plan? The plan is to, to shift, to move treasure to the other side. How do you do that? You, you do that by living a holy life, a godly life, a listening life, an obeying life. And you're shipping as much forward as you can. You want me to read some more? Okay. Didn't know if I'd lost everybody there. Now, why is it so important to put it over there? Where neither moth nor rust destroys. So a good thing to know there's no moths in heaven. Okay, that's a good thing to know. No rust and no thieves to break in and steal. There'll be lots of thieves in heaven, people that were thieves, but not anymore. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, what does that mean? If your treasure is not stockpiled here, your treasure is actually in heaven, where is your heart going to be? Your heart's going to be in heaven. You say, well, what will happen to my life? It'll mean your focus is here. It's not that it's bad to be here, but you're not, you realize you're not going to be here forever. You're just passing through, and, and your whole purpose while you're here is to keep shipping things ahead, pushing it ahead, forwarding address ahead, heaven, heaven, heaven. Now, some people have said in the past, well, this person is so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. You can be so earthly minded you're no earthly good. If you are truly heavenly minded the way this describes, you're going to be nothing but earthly good. You may not fit in. You may look like an anomaly because you're thinking about going somewhere else. And in our case as Christians, that you've never been. How could I be more excited about a place I've never seen, never been than I am about being right here? Because this is a mess. I've been to some of those beautiful places on the planet, but I'm going to tell you what, just what you see in the physical realm, the spiritual darkness on this planet and in people is insanity. What people have capacity for, I do not want to stay here eternally unless it's remade. New heaven, new earth. I'm a mess. It's a mess. This cannot be heaven. Now, sadly, the people that don't, don't become Christians, this is as close to heaven as you're ever going to get because it's hell from here. So look around, enjoy it, knock yourself out because if you deny Christ, this is as good as it's ever going to get. Where your treasure is, there will, there will your heart be also. So where is my heart? I don't have to guess where your heart is it's kind of like knowing what's going on in somebody's heart by what comes out of their mouth. The mouth is not the issue. The heart is what the issue is. So where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So if I watch your life and you watch my life, would someone say his heart is in heaven because it looks like that's where he's shipping all his treasure, her treasure? Go to the next one. John 14. John 14, verse 1. <clears throat> so in the context of not being here, 
Jesus came from heaven, comes here, born of a virgin, lives a sinless life, dies on a cross, buried, raised from the dead, goes back to heaven. Before he goes back, John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, or the word means dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. So if there wasn't a place for you, I would have told you that. But the reason I didn't tell you that is because it's not true. There is a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Now, I don't know about you. This is just kind of a thing with me. Um, Every once in a while, my wife, Rebecca, will tell you this. I go online and look up crazy ranches and crazy houses. And I've mentioned this before the other day. The thing that is so interesting about all those houses is no matter if it's 50,000 square feet, however big and majestic and opulent it is, all the toilets are the same size. I'm just throwing that in again because I think it's fascinating. (laughs) There ain't no king size, love seat, mega toilet, right? Because they're just toilets. But I look at those houses, and you say, well, why do you look at those houses? Well, they're, they're beautiful, and they're rooms, and high ceilings, and beams, and fireplaces you could walk into and have a camp out in the fireplace. <laughs> right? And if you go look at all that, you say, well, what do you think about that? Oh, I think it's beautiful. They're cool, and it's amazing. I love the architecture, and a shower is, you know, this way. And you know, certain things about a house are intriguing. And I realize... Here, I'll never have one of those houses. But you know why I don't care? I found me. Who knows me and has gone ahead and is building me a house. Right? Now you say, well, how big will it be? I don't know. Big. I'm not sure it'll have toilets. I don't know how that works up there, but it'll be nice if it is. So I could chase down here a mansion. I could say I'm going to make a bunch of money. Treasure, treasure, treasure. Build me that house. And, and, and I've talked to home builders who build these homes. 50,000 square foot homes. Parking garages underground. Theaters. Just everything you can come up with. And how many of these builders tell me that's not always, but too many times, someone gets that house built, they move in, and it almost destroys their family. Because they thought it would be a home, and it turned out just to be a house. And a house can never make a home unless you have a family unless you have something going on other than a building around you. In the same way that fancy, I'm not against church buildings. But be careful when your church building is fancier than your church. If your church building is more impressive than your church, you got a problem. When your barns are nicer than your livestock, you're in trouble. People roll up on a ranch, they should be going, wow. We got a guy in the room, family in the room, they, they raise black Angus cows. And I promise you, when you see one of those cows, you know you've seen a cow, right? <laughs> this ain't no normal cow, normal bull. Your focus, pretty ranch, but your focus is on the cattle because that's what it's about. So, the Bible doesn't even promise, by the way, shelter on this side. Food and clothing, they're with to be content. So you say, well, I, I don't have a fancy house. You will. A forever house, though. Are you okay with that? Because see, if you're not okay with a future house, You'll chase this life for a temporary house and waste the only life you've got looking like you're from here, not from there. Okay, probably enough on that point. No, let's finish that. 
Um, he said, where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, right? Because it's hard to know where, where someone's going if you've never been where they are going. And how can we know the way? So we don't know where you're going, so how in the world would we know the way to get there? Jesus said to him, I'm the way. You think you don't know the way? I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you say, I want to get to heaven. I want to make heaven. I, I want to go where you're talking about. There's only one doorway. There's only one way to get into heaven, and that's him. He is the way. He is not a way. He is the way. So people say, well, I'm going to heaven. And I say, well, then you met Jesus. No, I didn't meet Jesus. Then you're not going to heaven. Well, what do you mean? That sounds too narrow. I'm not, I'm not making this up. He said it. Well, there have, all roads lead to God, and you're exactly right. Only one road leads to heaven, and that's Jesus. Everybody will end up facing God, but not everybody will make heaven. First Corinthians chapter two. Um, now I'm about to read you this, but unless God does something, the Holy Spirit does something, I've read it, and I still have no idea. I got a glimpse, but I have no idea what this means, truly. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, but as it is written, and he's quoting from the Old Testament, I'm not going to go read it over there, and this is what it says. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But... God has revealed them to us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So what is he talking about? Whatever it is, what has he just said it is? It's something that no eye has ever seen. It's something that no, no ear has ever heard or heard of, nor have entered into the heart of man. Nobody seen it, heard it, has not even contemplated in their heart what? The things which God has prepared for those who love him. So um, I've seen some beautiful places. I've slept in some comfortable beds. I've, you know, been, you know, whatever you, whatever you can do down here, there's a certain amount of, there's just a limit to where, where you can go and what you can do. So if you say, hey, let's go to this really nice place. Um, you know, my idea of camping, for instance, is a Prevo motorhome that takes us to the hotel where we're staying. <laughs> now we're, I, I got a witness back there, right? That is my idea of camping. Now, I understand that may not be your idea of camping. I have no desire to go out in the woods where there is no toilet except the one we make. You know, I, got, I, I don't want to smell bad. I don't want to be sticky. I, you know, I could do it if I had to for Jesus, but he's about the only one I'm doing this for. Right. So you, you, I'd rather spend one night in a great place than 10 nights in a hole, right? So I'll go one night, one place. But if I come up with the fanciest place I can come up with, a presidential suite somewhere in some hotel, somebody's house, my book says that I has not seen. So whatever I've seen, whatever you've seen, wherever you've been, you've not seen this. And whatever you've heard about, you've not heard about this. And whatever you've imagined, the, the wildest thing you can come up with, not even entered into the heart of man, what? The things that God has prepared for those that love him. So there is no way that there's going to be anything on this side going to do what the other side is going to accomplish. So what do you do in the meantime? And it is mean sometimes. You go, well, my life sucks. They turn my water off. They turn my electricity off. There's holes in the roof, blah, blah, blah. What do you come up with? Stop focusing on your dump here and start focusing on your home there. And say, you know what, Lord, I can deal with this. It's not going to be much longer anyway. So I thank you. I trust you. I don't live here. I'm not from here. So here's what should be happening. Someone should meet me or you. And maybe they start out with this question. They say, hey, where are you from? Uh, and really what they were going to ask is, 
You're not from around here, are you? Because something is so different that they really don't even need to ask where are you from. They already know you're not from around here. You're not from around here, are you? And they pick up on that. So what's the answer? You say, no, I'm not. I was born here, but I'm not from here. Now, how can that be possible? Because I'm from somewhere else. Well, how'd that happen? I got born somewhere else. So you see, I was born here. That's where I'm from. Okay, you get born a second time. You're born there. Your new home. And sooner or later, if all that's true, someone's going to pick up on that you're not from here primarily. You're from somewhere else. Just the way you talk. The things you talk about. The joy, the peace, all the stuff that's described in Scripture. Like, dude, you look like you're from another planet. You got problems, you got health issues, you got financial challenges, you got all kinds of things going on, and yet you have joy. It's like your your plane never comes down below the clouds. You're up there like all you have is sunshine, even though it's raining everywhere. You're not from here, are you? No, I'm just passing through. And sooner or later, this is what ought to be happening. Someone will look at you and say, Take me with you. Will you take me with you? Because where you seem to be headed and who you are is nothing like who I am because I'm only from here and I've only got here. If you think you're getting out, take me with you. How many people are you taking with you? Even trying to take with you. Philippians 3, you're in luck. I got lots of verses today. He's going to run out. Oh, no, 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 I'm not going to run out. (laughs) Philippians 3, look at it right here in Scripture, verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who walk, who so walk as you have, as you uh, have us for a pattern. So, Join in, so Paul's telling this church at Philippi, join in following my example, watch me, note those who so walk, find other people who are doing the same thing, as you have us for a pattern. So, you, so find people that can be a pattern. You say, well, Paul's gone. Look what he wrote. And who did we leave behind? Discipleship is supposed to leave behind people that you can follow. So find someone, you go, that guy's going where I want to go. That, he's going the same place I'm going. I'm going to figure out how to get there and do what he's doing by following that person, that pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in, is in their shame. And look at how they operate. Who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Set your mind not on earthly things. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. Now, I cannot tell you that I do this 100%. The older I get, the more this is true. And the more I walk with him, the more this is true. It ought to be kind of like this. You go to sleep at night and you say, okay, Lord, I'm going to sleep. I pray protection, whatever you pray, my dreams, whatever, I'm going to sleep. And I know there's a chance that I may go to sleep and wake up in heaven. And if that's what's coming, I'll see you in a minute. Good night. And you go to sleep. And then you wake up and you go, Oh my gosh, I didn't die. He didn't come back. So I got another day. But what if he comes back today? Uh, One of the great examples of this, and the way this will go down a little bit, is you somewhere, Instagram, somewhere, they got these little stories about a mom teaching school at home, and her son's been deployed in the military. And what happens? She is eagerly awaiting his return. 
and she thinks it's going to be soon, and then he surprises her. And they're rolling tape, and she screams and hugs his neck, and he surprises her and everything. It's on the news. People just blow it up. Why? Because it's what she's been waiting for, and there's nothing going to happen bigger than her son or daughter coming home from deployment. Now, is that how I'm living? I wake up and I go, Lord, okay, I'm still here. I get it. There must be work to be done today. Treasure I've got to transfer. So you know it sucks down here. You've been here. You have the T-shirt, everything that goes with it. You know, right? This, is, this may not be a good day, but it's a day that you've made and I'm clearly here. But I'm telling you, I would trade any day. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. So I'll do what you've told me to do. I'll, I read the scriptures. I'll follow you. I'll trust you. I'll obey you. But I'm telling you, if you want to come back today, I'm ready. And I eagerly await that. Eagerly await that. Now you say, well, I don't feel that way. Then, then you, like me, have found cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, some other distraction that is a bigger deal than him. And what could be a bigger deal than Jesus coming back? I went on the uh, State Department website and I figured out that as a, since I'm a dual nationality person here in heaven, I found my, uh, I found my, my, Visa designation. I'm an H-2A. Does anybody know what an H-2A is? I'll read you what an H-2A is. I am a temporary agricultural worker. I'm here to sow the seeds of the gospel. And when he says I'm done, I'm out of here because it's just temporary. Too many of you are B2. Do you know what a B2 visa is? Tourism. You think you're here on vacation. And we wonder why we don't set our minds on things above. Interesting thing with all the immigration stuff, you know, you can build a wall and stop drug trafficking, all those political things. But if you watch the state of Texas, especially the southern border for a very long time, there's a very interesting thing that happens. Migrant workers do something. Migrant workers who work in the fields and harvest things and do that kind of work, do you know what they do when their job's done? They go home because they don't want to be here, because this is not where they're from. They come here to do a job, and they go back to where they're from, because there's no place like home. Now, that's all good, unless this is home. If heaven is home, you're going to be here in a different state of mind. If here is home, it's going to be hard. I also find it very fascinating how many people hate America, and everybody in the world's trying to get here. If it's such a terrible spot, you think people be leaving here. And even the people who hate this place don't leave. They threaten to. They're still here. I can think of some people I'd buy a one-way ticket for if they just really get serious, right? So, oh, okay, there you go. And by the way, that is not in my notes. That's just B2. Okay, Colossians 3. Colossians 3, 1. If then you were raised with Christ, okay? So that would make you a Christian. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. 
For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So now you say, well, I'm a business person. What are you saying? Your business is a way to fund your life and fuel ministry. If it's not about laying up treasures down here, then you're saying, okay, God, so God gifted me to do what I do. If you're a business person and you, you know how to make money, he's gifted you to do what you do. But what are you doing with that gift? If, you're think, if all you think about is business, all you think about is what you're doing to make money and what you're going to buy and all those things, you're, you're, you're capped. But if you understand that you've been given a gift and God has gifted you to make money, and so you have that tool and you use that tool, as God said, you can't ha have nice things. The Bible's full of people that have nice things. Let me tell you what you can have. You can have whatever he tells you you can have. Well, I'm going to go buy such and such a car. No, you're not. You're going to ask God if you have permission to go buy such and such a car. Well, I'm going to buy this house. No, you're not. You're going to say, Lord, do I have a permission to buy and live in this house? Whether I eat or drink, whatever I do, do all to the glory of God. So is there anything that I'm buying or doing or going that won't bring honor and glory to God? I'll give it up if not. So you meet a business person who makes money and has set their mind not on things on the earth but on things of heaven. They understand they are stewards. They are, they are going to use as much or as little time as possible to generate the revenue in order to focus on heaven and find out why God blessed them with what he blessed them with so they can move those funds or move whatever the resources they have in order to enable the world to move the treasure over there, not here where, you, where, where it's just going to rust and, rust and moth, moths are going to eat it. So do you know any business people like that? Are you that business person? Are you just consumed with money in here? And then I talk to these guys who say, well, I'm going to work like you know what for the next 30 years and not think about God. And then I'm going to have pile up all this money. And then I'm going to retire. And then I'm going to go into ministry. The problem is you're going to blow through the 30 years you've given to money and you've not given that time to your relationship with him. So you can't hear his voice. So when you get to that spot, you don't know who he is in the first place. Instead of a working, walking relationship where you've refined it along the way. Hebrews 11. We'll do a few more. Hebrews 11. Go down to verse 8. By faith Abraham. So he's talking here about Abraham. Um, verse 9. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as, a foreign, as in, a, in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the, Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He's like, I'm not from here. This is not what I'm looking for. This is not where I'm going. This is not where I'm even from. Go on down to verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, uh, but having seen them afar off, were accursed of them, assured of them, seeing them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed what? That they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them they get it. I am not from here. I'm just passing through. And then down in verse 35 of Hebrews 11, women received their dead, raised to life again. And then boom, in the middle of that verse, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. So you get in a situation where you're tortured and they say, if you'll renounce Christ, we'll spare your life. And the thought that runs through your head if you've been walking with God is they will not accept the deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. In other words, you know what? Even if you do what you do, do what you will. I'm about to be home. And that's what I've been thinking about anyway. So if this is how he says fit to get me out of here being tortured for his name's sake, then so be it. But I'm about to be home. And that's what I've been thinking about. 
Hebrews 13, 14. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Um, I've lived some other countries, lived in Dallas a very long time. Um, it's a great town. It's not home. My hometown is heaven. The new Jerusalem. A place that I'm homesick for and I've never even been. You say, well, what do you think the coolest thing about getting there will be? Because the Bible describes it in Revelation, just this blow your mind, just the new Jerusalem itself is just mind-boggling. Um... My dad had a big brother who was preparing to be a medical missionary, was in college, got cancer, and died. Never met my uncle. Looking forward to seeing my uncle that I've never met. Looking forward to seeing my grandfather. Looking forward to seeing my mom, my dad. But you can have them all. If I get to see my Jesus. So I don't care how fancy the house is he built me. I don't care how incredible heaven is physically. There will be nothing like seeing him. You say, well, I don't feel that way. And I understand. People say, oh, I miss my dad. I miss my mom. I miss my brother. I miss my sister. All these people you miss. I'm trying to help you get to the place and help us get to the place where we miss him more than anybody or anything else. And just to see him and fall at his feet, see the nail prints in his hand, put our hand in his side. Because I got nothing without him. I got nothing. If he was not willing to come and live and die and do what he did, I got nothing. He is my only ticket. He is my only way. He is my only truth. My notes just fell on the ground. I may have saved you like a whole 20 minutes right there. <laughs> so, you say, well, I don't, I don't think about it the way you think about it or you're trying to think about it. I don't see it that way. I don't feel that way. Maybe you don't today. What I'm encouraging you to do is think about it. And say, okay, Lord, why do I not feel that way? What have I gotten so attached to? Why have I got more treasure here than there? What, what steps am I willing to take? Where that what it looks more like and really is that I'm not from here. And people want to go where I'm going because the way I think about it and talk about it, they realize there's nothing here either. They want to go with me. First Peter 1, let me just read you a couple of things here and then we'll shut her down. You know what? Go to First Peter 2. Read First Peter 1 on your own for extra credit. First Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. So what does he see us as? Sojourners and pilgrims. Just passing through. 
I grew up on a song, and some of you may know the song. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just a passing through. And our Father, um, there'll be nothing like being there with you. But it, obviously we're still here. And there's a reason for us being here. For, a, for many people, Lord, the reason they're still alive is you've been merciful. And you've called their name. You've sent people their way. People have shared the gospel, told them that you love them, that there's, there's the promise of eternal life if they would just receive the gift of eternal life. And up to now, they've said no. But today, something has changed. They have sensed you tugging on their heart and giving them faith to believe. And they would say, God, I know that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead to offer me the forgiveness of sin and eternal life. I accept as a gift eternal life with you in heaven forever. I accept the forgiveness of my sins as a gift. I ask you to come live in me and through me and change me and make me a citizen of heaven and change my life so dramatically that people literally think I'm not from here anymore. Show me how to live the life you intended, how to lay up treasure there, not here, and to maximize the pilgrimage, the sojourn that I have here, Lord, to bring honor and glory to you. And Father, for believers that we've gotten sucked in, caught up into everything but, but you, and we really are so earthly-minded that we are not any earthly good in terms of changing the world. And we are willing to have you recalibrate us, Lord, where we think about you and your majesty and your glory and your holiness and your power and your might and your love and what it is you've, you're trying to accomplish and made possible through your Son. And that our focus would be more than ever to always be ready to give a reason for the hope that's within you. And whatever sin, whatever distraction has kept us from that pursuit, that, Lord, we would maximize the time we have here laying up treasure in heaven. You're the best. Thank you for being patient with us. And I pray that you would use us this day as never before, light a fire as never before, Lord that we would want your kingdom to come, your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.